Hey everybody, how are you? I hope you're excited about another edition of Our Purpose class. Benjamin Genty is in a class all by himself. He is one of the greatest listeners I have ever known. He is a counselor in his own right. He's a mentor to young boys and I know for a fact that his heart is a heart of gold. Sit back and relax as you prepare to be changed from Benjamin Genty. Hi, my name is Benjamin Genty, and welcome to The Purpose Class. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the middle child of three, first generation Haitian American, born and raised in Montclair to two immigrant parents. I went to Montclair High School, I graduated in 2008. I got my bachelor's in psychology from William Patterson University. And I'm currently enrolled at Fordham University for my master's in education. My favorite thing to eat is legume, particularly lalo with white rice and sauce pie, which is a bean sauce. My favorite movie is Miss Doubtfire. If you've seen it, you know why. But I think for me, Miss Doubtfire, the father in the movie, Robin Williams, goes above and beyond to do all he can for his children. And I think that message is one that I have carried with me. I wanna do all that I can to change the world. I wanna to go to the extreme to ensure that my kids, to ensure that those that love me have what they need. <sighs> After 10 years of Starting school, falling off the wheel, picking back up again. In 2017, I finally confirmed my degree. And I think it was surprising for many, including me, um, that it took me so long. I graduated high school with $50,000 in scholarships. And I chose to go to Rutgers University where the tuition was half of that, so I had pocketed a decent amount of cash. But I was broken inside, but I was hurting. I was lost. And my college journey started this inquiry of sorts. One of my most regrettable moments was having an abortion in 2013. I was dating a girl who was in love with me and I was in love with her. I always envisioned having a family, but I, didn't, I never saw it happening this way. And being a church kid, being a pastor's kid, being a church baby. When she told me she was pregnant, I knew that it wasn't the right time. And so I convinced her to have an abortion. And that was, and still is to this day, one of my most regrettable moments. The decision to abort, the coercion, showed me a lot about my darkness that I didn't want to confront. But on the other side of that, after, I, after the abortion had happened, after some time had elapsed, I learned how wounded I was, I saw how broken I was, and I saw how much I needed and wanted family. Although I didn't grow up in a broken home, I wasn't close with my nuclear family. Um, born and raised in church, born and raised in this very, very conservative Christian, 
education, family. Um, there's some things that marked my experience in my childhood growing up. And so when I was nine, my father stopped going to church with us. Um, as a family, me, my dad, my mom, and my two siblings traveled to New York to go to church every Sunday. And I was too young to really understand what was happening, but at some point my father decided like he didn't want to go with us anymore. We decided to go to Shiloh in, in Jersey. And one day when I, was, when I was at church, leaving to go home, one of the deaconesses said, hey Ben, go say hi to your sister. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, don't, that, that's your sister over there. And I was dumbfounded, I was clueless. And she said, Did, you didn't know? She said, oh my God, you really didn't know. As a nine-year-old kid, I found out that my father, who was my Superman, who was the ideal, who was my hero, had other kids that I knew nothing about. And so at nine, my world came, my world as I knew it came crumbling down. Um, I wanna ensure that I say that prior to this, my world was perfect. It was, it was ideal, it was spectacular. My parents loved me, I, I, I knew that I loved them. I loved my siblings. Although I wasn't very, very close with my siblings, I knew that I felt loved and I knew that I was cared for. But at nine, when I was leaving church with the deaconess who lived downstairs from me, with the news that my father had another child I knew nothing about, it changed my world forever. And as a kid, I caved. As a nine-year-old child, I learned to withdraw and to protect myself. And so that's what I did. And so began this identity crisis. I questioned everything. I didn't know what was true. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what to believe or who to, who to believe. And that followed me into my middle school years. It followed me into my high school years. And after graduating high school, it followed me into my college years. I think one of the hardest things I've heard my entire life was my father telling me at 17 that I was gonna have to support myself through college. My brother, who was 13 months older than me, went to the Rutgers in New Brunswick and had failed <laughs> his first and second year. My father had put the bill for him. And so I know that, I knew that, I knew that my dad would support me. I, knew, I just knew that my dad would put my bill too. And when I was 17, my father said, what I did for him, I won't do for you. I knew that I had to grind. And so graduating, top of my high school class with $50,000 in scholarships was a big thing for me. It was performative. It was done to get my father's attention, my father's love. And so began this, this quest, this journey to, 
to get attention from someone who I didn't believe ever wanted me. Mentors matter. And while I wasn't close with my brother growing up, there was a young man who took me under his wing. His name was Yolens. He was nine years my senior. And at 14, he was 23. He was, we were both tenors in the choir. We sat next to each other in choir practice and he knew that my mother was overbearing and very, very protective of me and my brother. And so after choir practice, he would take us home. But he saw something in me. He saw a wound. He saw a hurting kid. He saw a struggling kid. And he mentored me. And he ministered to me. And he held me close. And I'm grateful to him because he was and is the older brother I always wanted and always needed. Me and my father weren't close. I always had the support of your ones. I always had his wisdom. I always had his presence. He was always around. Yolens wasn't a surrogate father, but he was a present mentor. He was active. He was involved. He was relentless in his pursuit of me. And for nine years, he ministered and mentored me until I let him in. And because of Yolens, because of his presence in my life, I know it's my responsibility to ensure that other teens like me, running, wild, lost, questioning, have a mentor, have someone in their back pocket that they can reach for. So Mia is my baby. And I got her after one of the most tumultuous years of my life. In 2017, I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology from William Patterson University. In May of that year, everything was going well. I was in a relationship that I thought was leading to marriage. I had finally, after 10 years, graduated with my degree. Everything was ideal. And six months later, my relationship fell apart. I moved out of my parents' home. I left my church. I lost all emotional and relational support. And my life as I knew it was crumbling. And for six months, I did some real, real, real tough work to get to the bottom of me and to figure me out. And at the end of that, what I realized was that if I never get married, if I never have kids, if I never raise a family in the natural sense or in the typical sense, I can create my own idea of family. And it started with Mia. My cousin, Butter, his name is Aaron, but we call him Butter, was starting a family. He had a baby boy who was two and a baby on the way. And he asked me if I could watch Mia take care of her because he couldn't do both. And so I took her in. And she has restored my joy and restored my hope and restored my belief in family, the idea of family. Thank you. 
for hearing a bit about my story. I hope you take some time to pause on purpose. Spirit of the living God, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you on behalf of my brothers and my sisters around the world that are struggling, that feel overlooked, that are wrestling with their worth and their value and their identity in you. I intercede on behalf of my sister and my brother, those who I know and those who I don't, that are yearning for community, that are thirsty for affection, for attention, that need a touch from you, that need to be reminded of your love. Father, I ask that you would be the father to the fatherless, that you would be the friend to the friendless, that you would be the mother to the motherless, that you would be God to them. Lord, all things work together for the good of those that are called according to your purpose. And I know that you are perfecting us even in this. Would you remind those that have made decisions they regret? Would you remind those that are struggling and wrestling through poor decisions that even in this, you are using this part of the, their story for your glory? Even in this, even in this, even in this, Lord, would you be present? Would you come near? Would you come close? Would you remind us that there is more? Remind us that it's not over. Remind us that you have a purpose and a plan for us. Remind us, reveal to us Show us, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the mentors that you have already dispatched. I thank you for the resources that you have already made available for us. We thank you for provision that's already on the way. We ask that you would allow us to be patient as we process. Allow us to be present in this moment as we reckon through and wrestle through the wreckage of this moment. We know that you're God. We believe you to be a comforter to those that need comfort. We believe you to be the author and the finisher of our faith. And even in this, we trust you because we know that all things work together for the good of those that are called to your purpose. We trust you. We believe in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Then you will truly be successful. And we know all things work together for the good. Gotta work together. The good. Gotta work together. Oh. And we know all things work together for the good. Gotta work together. The good to those who love God. He has a word on your lips. To those who are called. Meditate on your day. According to be his purpose, to do what purpose. it's his purpose, Ooh. not mine. And we know all things work together for the good. Gotta work together. The good. Gotta work together. And we know all things work together for the good. Gotta work together. The good. To those who love God. He has a word on your lips. To those who are called on oh, according to Be his purpose, purpose, it's his purpose, not mine.
It is day 72 of our 90-day challenge, and we are in the book of Colossians. Colossians, the fourth chapter, the first through the twelfth verse. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a faithful and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have provided a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. And that ends our reading for today. Our topic is the underdog. Around the time Colossians was written, everyone had their eyes on Paul. Paul was the Billy Graham of tent revivals, the Joel Osteen of megachurches, the Rick Warren of New York Times, the Oprah of entertainment, and the Steve Jobs of Apple. If the early church held conferences like we do, Paul would be rescued from prison in order to headline the event. He was the man, but he was not the only man. While Paul was in Rome writing and converting, God was raising up an underdog by the name of Epaphras to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, and nobody saw it coming. Warning to the church that assumes... God will only speak through the preacher we most prefer. Be careful not to equate God's power to a personality. Be careful not to run to the popular place instead of the needed place. Ultimately, power belongs to God. And often it comes wrapped in swaddling clothes. It comes dressed in something we least expected. If it weren't for Epaphras, Many would not know Jesus. And in the same way, I think Epaphras represents many of you. You are the underdog. You are the runner-up. You've been training all year, just like the headliners, but everybody's got their eye on Paul. Look at Colossians 1, 6 through 8. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Paul says this, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. So listen, Epaphras, don't get bitter. Embrace your position, because there are people waiting to hear your message. Apophras' name is only mentioned three times in the Bible, but his ministry extends beyond his years. He is a minor character with a major calling. He serves as the bridge between his people, the Gentiles, and his mentor, Paul. Apophras is an evangelist without an honorarium. He is a preacher without a degree. Apophras doesn't abandon his neighborhood to preach to the nations. Instead, he starts his work at home, the place where nobody wants to preach, to people who are less than astute. This is where he is assigned. And here's my favorite lesson about Apophras. His name 
means handsome or beautiful. Both his name and his calling reveal this. When God looks at beauty, God stares at your feet and not your face. Romans 10, 15 reminds us how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So God is not watching your Facebook. He's looking at your feet book. Where are your feet taking the gospel? God is concerned about his purpose in you and not the pedicure on you. Paul also calls Epaphras a fellow prisoner. But how did Epaphras end up in prison? Research reveals that Epaphras brought the issues of his people to Paul in Rome. That means he traveled for two months to get help from Paul and quite possibly submitted himself to prison, all in the name of saving his people from religious pluralism. It begs the question, how far is your intercession willing to go? Do you love your people enough to go the distance of personal imprisonment? Real evangelists will bring the gospel anywhere. Gone are the days when we can ride off of convenience. Faith for an underdog means you will do radical things in order to see God move in a radical way. So welcome, underdog. This is the year that nobody will see you coming. This is the year that God will raise you up to center stage. It's the year where second is the new first. It's okay to be an underdog. Why? Because being an underdog teaches you how to be under God. Day 72 of our 90 day challenge and we are in Colossians. There's a beautiful story about a man named Apophris. Apophris, in my opinion, is an underdog, but Apophris has been educated because he has been connected to Paul. Paul trusts Apophris to minister to a church and a city that he never actually goes to. The Colossian church would not have been what it was if it wasn't for Epaphras, but Epaphras would not have been who he was if he hadn't sat and studied under Paul. He was studying with Paul while in prison because there are some learning institutions that are not comfortable or convenient. Sometimes we have this idea about purpose that every part of it will be pleasurable, but there are some problematic and even difficult, painful moments that make purpose important because you're the answer to someone else's problem. Today, I want you to know this is the year of the underdog. This is the year of the person that was least likely to succeed. Even if your name is Apophis, even if your name is Paul, even if your name is Sean, I want you to know your purpose matters to God. I want you to know your purpose is going to change the city that you occupy. So be the underdog unapologetically and watch God change your life.